Hey, you guys. Really glad to be here. My name is Lucas. As he said a few times, I um, was here a number of years ago. You know, this morning I sent a text message to one of my buddies who is an engineer at a place not too far from here, which employs a lot of engineers. And I said, <clears throat> what was the most difficult engineering class in the entire program, uh, you know, that you went through. And he said, well, um, and I told him I was uh, going to be at Letourneau today. And he said, well, actually, we have five different um, engineers here at, in our department that graduated from Letourneau, so let me go ask them, uh, because they could tell you what the hardest class at Letourneau was in the engineering program. And so he went around, he got up from his cubicle, he went around, and uh, it was 8.30 in the morning, they're supposed to be there at 8. None of them were there. He texted me back and said, they're all gone. They haven't, they haven't even arrived yet. And I was thinking, you know, maybe that was a trend that began at Letourneau, and you just carry it on, you know, late for those, you know, the fluid dynamics or, you know, mechanics or whatever the hardest classes were. What, what, were some of the hard, what are some of the hardest classes for you guys? So feel free to shout it out. Chapel. <laughs> yeah, chapel. Yeah, me too, buddy. I mean, look, that's difficult. So here's what I'm going to say to you is don't be tired. Anybody tired? Anybody tired? It's, it's okay to be physically tired. At this point in the semester, man, we're tired, right? And by the way, it has been the weirdest year. I mean, in my entire memory, I, I don't remember a year like this. And all of, all of what's happening just, man, it makes me so tired. And on top of that, for you guys, you're at the point in the semester where you just have to get it done. It's late nights, it's studying, and there is a lot of tiredness. But what I want to do today is I want to explore this idea of not being tired. How do we, how do we overcome the tiredness? And that's what we're going to talk about. Now, I do want to say that while I was at, uh, while I was at Letourneau, Oh, these don't do the same thing. i got a screen down here. Uh, <clears throat> while I was at Letourneau uh, in the early 2000s, it made me incredibly tired. And so this verse would have really challenged me at the time. Notice what this says. And let us not grow weary while doing good. Let us not grow weary while doing good. Now, a guy named Paul wrote this. And it's easy to look at Paul and say, hey, that's nice to say, but, but how? I mean, life is wearing us down. You know, when I was at Laterno, I, uh, I had a lot going on. And I, I'm remembering this one semester. It's actually the semester that Daniel was talking about um, where I was, uh, I was hosting Hootenanny. So I was preparing for that. But then on top of that, I had a full load of classes like most of you, most of you do, a full load of classes. And then in addition to that, I had a number of other things going on off of campus. For instance, I was, a, I was a youth minister at a church out of town. So I was driving over there on Wednesdays and Sundays and then having to get, it, to get back for class. And then in addition to that, I was in this band where we did events all over the, you know, kind of all over the state. And every Thursday, I would, I, I, I got it where I didn't have classes on Thursday. I would get on a jet in Dallas. I'd have to drive to Dallas, get on a jet, fly out to Lubbock. We played a gig out there every Thursday night. It was a big Bible study at Texas Tech. And then I would come back on Friday morning and try to get back for classes. So all of these things were going on. Then in addition to that, I was different places every, you know, on the weekends and stuff like that. So my time at Letourneau was just a blur. But here's what I told myself. I, I said, you know, it's all good stuff, right? I mean, all this stuff, none of it's, it's not like I'm, I'm stomping on a bag of baby ducks here. I mean, it's all good stuff. It's everything I'm doing. And so I, I would just say yes to whatever. Just, you know, fill the list up and I'll just, I'll just do it. And that's how I lived my life for, for quite a while. Now, when I got out of Letourneau, um, I, I did graduate eventually after my third senior semester. I graduated and, um, and went out into the world and started doing work, the kind of work a, you know, a person like me who talks too much does. I got into ministry, and it was more of the same. It was just lots and lots and lots of stuff that I would say, well, it's good stuff. I'll just, I'll just keep doing it. And I started to get tired. I mean, I started to get really, really tired of having to keep up this kind of this kind of thing, you know, this kind of uh, schedule. And, and one of two things happens, I, I believe, when we get tired. One of the things that happens is we just stop doing the good that made us tired. We just stop. It's like, you know, maybe I'll replace it with something not so good. That's one of the ways. But I grew up in church. Most of the people I knew were, were believers. And so for me, 
I took the second route, and here's, here's what happens for the, you know, the other kind of folks. We get bitter. We keep doing the good stuff, the, the list, the schedule. We keep doing it, but we start to get bitter. We start to get frustrated. And we start to resent the people that are putting those expectations on us. Now, you might have noticed this. Like if you're in uh, fluid, fluid mechanics or whatever, your, your teacher, maybe they're putting all these expectations. It's easy to resent that teacher. It's not the teacher's fault. It's just, it's just the way that, uh, that we're designed. We, we often uh, begin to move in that direction. And so that's where I was. I started to get bitter. I started to get frustrated. I started to feel like I, I'm not going to be able to continue to do this kind of good. And so my bitterness led me kind of out of the church for a while. I mean, as a single guy, I was living on my own, and I, I, I you know, got out of the church. I, I developed a lot of really ugly habits. And so for me, that was where I wound up. Now, Paul's verse that we looked at really would challenge this, right? I mean, because he said, don't grow weary in doing good, but here I am, weary of doing good. I mean, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to deal with that? So, let us not grow weary while doing good. Nice thought, but how? I mean, how are we supposed to do this? Well, I think one of the ways that we can kind of get an answer to this is to explore a little bit what kept Paul going, right? Because that dude was unstoppable. I mean, something kept him moving forward. Something kept him going. And what I want to do just in the next few minutes in this mandatory chapel time is give you something that I think actually can help you in your life, help you to deal with the tiredness and the weariness that we're feeling. And so I want to take a look at what we might call Paul's history in ministry, kind of the things that he faced, the things that he dealt with. Here's one of the things that he says in one of his letters to his friends in Corinth. He says, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Now, that wasn't just because the Jews were mean. That was because he was doing something that the Jews said, do not do. Stop talking about this Jesus guy. You got to stop or we're going to beat you over and over and over. And by the way, this 40 stripes minus one, but what that basically means is they had this whip thing that had like leather straps, and they would put stuff on it. And and they liked the leather straps because when you hit somebody with it, it would kind of wrap around their skin and really give it to them. I mean, you really get a piece of them, you know. So they believed that if you had 40, you know, whippings, then it would kill you. You, you just keel over dead, I guess. And so they, they did the math. Said, well, how much wouldn't kill you? Maybe minus one. So they would do 40 minus one whippings. So I, I wasn't an engineering student. I'm not great with math. But he said he was whipped five times with 39. And I think, if I'm right, I think that's 195 times he was hit with that whip. Now, when I was a kid, when I got spanked, I had a dad that spanked me. If I got spanked, it only took one. And I'd be like, I ain't ever doing that again. He got spanked 195 times for doing what he's doing, and he just kept doing it. He just kept moving forward. But that's not the only thing. He also, this one is a little bit, um, a little bit different, but same kind of thing. Three times I was beaten with rods. Now, if you understand how physics works, which I, you know, I'm a little hazy on it, but the thing about a rod is you can really swing it hard. And so a rod is, is, is stiff, and so that means that all of the energy you put into the rod lands in one little spot on your back. And so all of that energy pow, right there on his back or on his legs or wherever they went. Three times he took this. You would think, Paul, just stop talking about Jesus and they'll stop hitting you. He's like, no, I just got to keep going. Do you think he was tired of being hit? Do you think he was tired of being whipped? Absolutely. But he kept pressing on. He kept moving forward. It's like, I got to keep going. I got to keep moving forward. What kept him going? He said, once I was stoned. Now, uh, by the way, uh, this isn't a state school, and I don't think of Laterno as a party school, but just I probably should say it. it doesn't mean what people now say when they say he was stoned. This means that what they would do is they would take you outside the city, because they don't want to get blood on their nice streets. They'd take you outside the city, and they'd pick up rocks, and they'd throw them at your head until you're dead. Now, when he said he was stoned, what he means is they did that to him and they thought they succeeded. Now, a lot of times in the Bible movies, what they'll do is they'll have like this crowd far off and they're like lobbing rocks like Hail Marys at him. Uh, Actually, the way this probably worked is the crowd would circle up around you 
so that you can't run off, because why wouldn't you run off if they're throwing rocks at your head? You know, that always bothered me in the, in the Bible movies. But the crowd would surround you, and they'd pick up the biggest rock they could lift, right? Because you want to get the job done. They'd pick it up, and bow. I mean, they did that to Paul. And they, 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 they looked at him, and probably somebody kind of went, well, yeah, I think he's dead. I think we did a good job. And they walked back into town thinking he was dead. Now, why did they do that? Because he's talking about Jesus. Like, Paul, stop talking about Jesus. Aren't you tired of them hitting you in the head with rocks? Absolutely he was tired. But he kept going. He pressed on. He kept moving forward. It's incredible. This guy is amazing. Notice what he says next. He says, three times I was shipwrecked. Now, <clears throat> I've never been in an aircraft uh, uh, wreck. Uh, that's not what you call it, a uh, crash. I've never been in an airline crash. But if I was in an airline crash, I wouldn't fly on a plane again. I mean, just, I would be done. Here Paul is, wrecks three times in a ship and still like, well, i just got to travel. I mean, my job, what I'm trying to do is get the gospel out to the entire world. I have to go on ships. That's just what I have to do. Three different times he wrecks in the ocean. And notice this, uh, this line after it. A night and a day I have been in the deep. You ever spent the night in the open ocean? Yeah, I mean, neither. It doesn't sound great, though. Can you imagine how tired you would be after treading water for, I don't know, 24 hours? This is incredible. You would think Paul would say, you know what, I think I'm going to retire because I am tired. But he doesn't. I'm just going to keep moving forward. I'm going to keep going. I have to keep going. I have to press on. What is making this guy tick? How is it that he can continue? Here's what he says. He kind of he gets ramped up here. He says, In journeys, often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Basically saying, everything's trying to kill me out here. Every time the name of Jesus comes out of my mouth, they're throwing rocks at me, they're beating me, my ship is going down, everything is trying to kill me. And he keeps moving forward. In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fasting, often in cold and nakedness. Now, I think we can start to identify with this one, right? Now, you may not be weary because you are out on a mission, but in a sense, being at Laterno is kind of like a mission because you're preparing for what, you're, what good you're going to do in your life, both in your career also in whatever kind of ministry God might have for you. And so there is a weariness that just comes along with being in college. There's a tiredness. And here's what we find out about Paul. He was tired. He was weary. So when he says don't grow weary in doing good, he must not be talking about physical weariness. He must be talking about something deeper. Something energizing, something within him that keeps him moving, even though his body threatens to give out. And I think, as we face the kind of weariness we face in college, in this university, at this university, we need to find that same kind of drive. Notice he says, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. You see, he had started so many churches, and especially late in his ministry, he couldn't be there with them. And, and many of them morally were falling apart. Many of them were being persecuted. He had concerns on a daily basis. On top of all that other stuff that's going on, he's concerned on a daily basis for those believers that are out there that are just among the wolves. So not only is he physically tired, he's emotionally tired. He's worn out from life. I don't know about you, but man, there are days when I just feel worn out by life. Now, I can't compare my experience to Paul's, but I can relate to it. I can feel that. So what kept Paul going? What kept Paul going? And I think what I'm going to tell you might actually surprise you. I think it'll surprise you. He says, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. So here's the first. This is just a practical step. This isn't the main thing, but this is one of his things. He looks, he looks not behind him. He doesn't look behind him. He doesn't focus on that bad grade. He doesn't focus on those whippings, although he did tell us about them. He doesn't focus on them. He doesn't keep his mind set on all the terrible things that happened. I mean, if you want to live a life of gratitude, you have to begin to focus somewhere other than all the difficulties that you face. Notice what he says next. 
and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. He keeps his mind focused on what's ahead. Now, it'd be easy to stop right there. And if I were just a motivational speaker, that's where I'd stop. I'd say, okay, so we just got to focus on our goals. We have to, you know, just keep looking forward and making sure we're, we're moving in the right direction and we're achieving. But that's not actually all he's talking about. That might be part of it, but that's not all he's talking about. He's looking further than his own physical goals. He's looking beyond that. He says, I press toward. Now, okay, so he's going to now tell us what keeps him going. What makes him go through all this stuff? He says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, there are a lot of people that look at this verse and they just assume he must be talking about his salvation. Because these are kind of like salvation-y sounding words, right? They sort of sound like salvation. I mean, like upward call and prize. Those kind of sound like that. But here's something to know about Scripture is that salvation is a free gift, right? We get it by believing. We get it by faith in Christ. It's a free gift that we receive when we place our faith in Christ. However, there's this other theme that's talked about in Scripture, and it's talked about a lot. I mean, every single New Testament writer talks about this idea of what we call reward. Now, the words that are used in the original language, words like, like mythos and antipodosia and I mean, all these interesting sounding words, they do not mean a free gift. They don't mean the same thing as salvation. Salvation is a free gift. Reward is something different. It's something extra. And by the way, the word prize falls into that category. You see, prize, brabion in the original language, prize means something that you receive for good performance. So in a sense, your good grade at the end of this semester, that's a prize, that's a brabion. That's what Paul might be talking about if he wasn't talking about spiritual things. He's talking about a reward, something extra, something beyond just salvation, something that Christ promises to give. Now, I'll give you an example of this. Think about the last chapter of the Bible. You get to the, just nearly the very end, and Jesus says, his final words in the Bible, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to those according to their works. That's not talking about salvation, because salvation is not by works, it's by faith. So there's this extra thing, and by the way, this is what Paul is motivated by. I mean, look at the verse. He says, I press toward the goal of the prize. He's motivated by reward, the reward that Christ will give when he arrives in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is fascinating to me. And by the way, I spent years in church, and I never heard this concept. Maybe once. I remember in junior high, one time, somebody mentioning something about eternal reward. And I never, I just, other than that, I don't remember ever talking about it. And so I wrote a book about it because it's, it's astounding to me that every single New Testament author talks about eternal reward as something apart from salvation, something extra, and something that not everybody gets an equal amount of. It's talked about all through the New Testament, but it's not talked about all through the modern church. We avoid it. And here we find out that it's what Paul is motivated by. At least it's one of the main things he's motivated by. So what kept Paul going? He's focusing on the reward. I mean, that's what he said in the verse. He focused on the reward, and that kept him moving forward. Can you just imagine that moment, like when, when they're whipping him? Whoosh, reward reward. It's an amazing thought. And it's also very practical because he can overcome anything that he faces, any kind of tiredness, any kind of weariness by focusing on what he acquires for it, what Christ has promised to give to those who are faithful to him. It's an amazing, amazing concept. So, now you see what I'm talking about. Don't be tired. To me, this doesn't mean that you can't be physically tired. We're going to be physically tired. Our bodies are going are, are to be tired. It's just physics. It's how it works. I guess that'd be biology. I didn't do well in the sciences. Uh, but, but it's just how things work. We're going to be physically tired. But what Paul is saying is you can dig below that. You can find a way to be energized even in suffering. And it's by focusing 
on that reward. Now, I kind of I did a little bit of a dirty thing. I cut this verse off. Now I want to show you what the rest of the verse says because really the rest of this verse actually talks about this concept. And let us not grow weary while doing good. Notice what he says after that. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Now, What's interesting about this is he's talking about doing good, right? And we know that Scripture doesn't say that you do good so that you can have salvation. Instead, it says you have faith in Christ and you have salvation. So now when he's talking about doing good, he's talking about reaping an eternal reward. Something special, something beyond, something above just having salvation. And so it's right there in the verse. This is his way of staying motivated, staying, uh, keeping from getting weary in doing good. So to do good without ever tiring, focus on the reward you're acquiring. I know it's a little cheesy, but I love rhyming things. I, I, I'm a, a failed poet, I guess. But to do good without ever tiring, focus on the reward you're acquiring. Now, I want to tell you about my own experience, because I think it wouldn't be quite fair to just leave the story where I left it a moment ago. So when I left Letourneau, I got into ministry, and I was a very busy boy. I just, I was involved in a lot of things, and it really burnt me out. I told you about that already. But then, it was a number of years ago now, I got a project, um, sometimes I um, I narrate um, audiobooks, and I got this, uh, this project, I got hired to narrate this audiobook, and it talked about this concept of reward. It talked about the kingdom of heaven and how this you know, reward is something that's all through Scripture, and it blew my mind. I mean, I had, I had, like I said, I had not heard about it much at all, and so I began to investigate this, and this was before I wrote that book I mentioned. I began to investigate this, and what I realized is this idea of focusing on reward, realizing that Christ wants to reward us for our faithfulness, it it rejuvenated me. It sort of of renovated me. It, It allowed me to begin to push aside the cynicism, push aside the bitterness, and really begin to move in the right direction. And now I am I am physically tired. I, I, by the way, I have a, a newborn in the house, so I'm, you know, that's another thing. I'm physically tired, but I'm excited. I'm excited about what Christ is doing in the world. I'm excited about what he's doing in you. I'm excited about the, the, the ministry kind of things that come up for my wife and I. We are so excited, and a huge part of that is because we do exactly what we're talking about here. We focus on the reward. So you might be feeling like this is a little overwhelming. You might feel like, I, let's see, maybe, oh, there we go. You might be feeling like this is a little overwhelming, right? Like where do we begin? I mean, he's basically saying, hey, for the rest of your life, if you're a believer, and, and by the way, if you're not a believer in here, you know, I get it, so th- we're talking about being a believer now. If you're a believer, what he's basically saying is continue to do good stuff. Continue to do, uh, you know, to love one another, to do the things that Christ commanded us. We need to continue to do that for how long, Paul? For the rest of your life. And don't get tired. And that feels really overwhelming. And so in the next verse, he actually gives us kind of a priority to help us figure out, you know, where should our energy go most, pri- uh, most primarily? And so here's what he says in the next, uh, the next little section. He says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Notice he doesn't say sacrifice everything you have and, you know, empty your bank account and all that. He says, as you have opportunity. So you're going to be living a normal life. You're going to have a career, and and most people don't go into ministry, but you're going to have a a career in in the uh, private sector or maybe, you know, in in public service or something like that. But you're going to have a career, and you'll have these little moments, and you'll have some resources to do good things. And when you have those opportunities, he's basically saying, take them. Just, just take those opportunities. Take those opportunities to do good. Now, now who does he say to do that good to? Let us do good to all. So, so we're talking about unbelievers here, to, to people you meet, you know, somebody on the side of the road, to a friend, whatever. This is everybody. When we have opportunities to do good for just about anybody, we just take those opportunities. But notice what he says next, because this helps us see the priority. He says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, again, this was a kind of a surprising verse to me because what it's telling us is that we ought to prioritize our energy for doing good to other believers, to, to other, other Christians, other, other people that are in our sphere of influence. That's where our, most of our good energies should go. 
And to me, this helps because, uh, you know, you guys may be, um, may be from all over and maybe it's difficult to find a church in this area. You may be away from the church you're used to. So for now, the student body, your friends, other believers in the student body, this is where you ought to focus your energy. Do good for one another. Don't grow weary in doing good and especially for other believers because it's so important to that thing that Paul was focused on, to reward. And in fact, what we find in Scripture is that so much of reward is based on how we treat each other. Christ is going to reward us for how we treat one another. To do good without ever tiring, focus on the reward you're acquiring.